Welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, a three-time award-winning show that aims to inspire and motivate you while increasing the amount of female role models in the media. We showcase the stories of incredible women who are making a difference in the world of adventure, exploration, and physical challenges. I'm your host, Sarah Williams, and I'm thrilled to have you here. If you're passionate about adventure, challenge, and learning from women who have overcome obstacles and achieved remarkable things, then this is the podcast for you. Every week, we bring you new episodes featuring incredible women who share their stories, insights, and tips to inspire and motivate you in tackling your own personal challenges. And the best part? By supporting the Tough Girl mission on Patreon, you're not just helping to keep the show going, you're joining a community of people who believe in the power of female role models to inspire and empower others. Your support helps us continue to bring you high quality content and promote the stories of amazing women around the world. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you never miss an episode. New episodes every Tuesday at 7am UK time with occasional bonus episodes on a Thursday. Thank you for listening and for being a part of the Tough Girl community. Let's get started. My name is Rahima Kenny. I'm based in Cape Town, South Africa. You know, grown up here, lived in Cape Town all my life. I'm a runner and triathlete. That is what I really, really enjoy doing. I started off as a runner and it kind of just morphed into triathlon. And now I think I identify more as a triathlete than a runner. But yeah, for work, I am a management consultant and project manager. And I recently pivoted into freelancing. So I work for myself um, since the end of last year. Yeah, that was basically me. So what were you like as a little girl growing up in South Africa? Were you quite sporty, outdoorsy? Did you have any siblings? You know, what were your early years like? Yeah, so I'm the eldest of three siblings. I've got a younger sister and a younger brother. I was actually not that sporty at all. Um, I was the one that was never picked for the team at school. I was, was not very athletic at all. It's only kind of in my adult years that I started um, getting more into the running part. And I only learned to swim, believe it or not, when I was, I think I was 35 years old, 34, 35 years old. I basically learned to swim from scratch to do my first triathlon, which was a sprint triathlon. It was a 500 meter swim. And uh, yeah, from not being able to swim across the width of a pool to being able to swim 500 meters in a dam six months later was was quite a big thing for me. And I've always really been into health and fitness. Although I wasn't sporty, I've I've always just tried to remain healthy. Um, I have a very fragile immune system, so I I kind of have to. I, I don't have, I can't let myself go, which is kind of why I'm always into sport and healthy eating and all of those things. So how did you get into running? What did your running journey look like? My sister and I have a very uh, kind of special relationship because we ended up studying together. Although we are four years apart, um, life kind of, um, you know, took a little bit of a twist and we ended up studying the same degree at the same university at the same time. So at university, I was always walking a lot. So it was quite easy to kind of remain fit. I was doing karate at the time as well. Um, I did karate growing up in my high school years as well. During university, I got my black belt during that time. And then after I left university and started working, it started becoming very difficult to keep training karate. So at one point, um, my sister and I, we wanted to do something to keep fit. And so we thought, okay, let's uh, train for this five kilometer race that was happening. It's actually the Women's Day race, which is on um, Women's Day public holiday in South Africa. And we basically started from scratch. Like we we started running one kilometer, (laughs) built up to like two kilometers and then three kilometers and then built up to basically being able to do this five kilometer race. We made all the mistakes possible that one could possibly do in a race. We didn't even know what finishing cards were, what top bag drops were. So we, like, we actually ran with our bags, believe it or not. 
um, any runner now would just, would be absolutely horrified to hear that. But uh, yeah, and at the end of that, I was like, oh my word, that was so difficult. I don't think I will ever be able to be a real runner. <laughs> Looking at these people that run, you know, 10 kilometers up, it was something that I didn't really see myself doing. But then soon after we finished that five kilometer race, I started feeling kind of a little bit lost. Like, you know, I used to go to gym and, and then not even know what to do at gym because usually before that I was like, Oh, I need to go and do my treadmill two kilometer run. And now it's like, what do I do now? And then we signed up for another 5k and we did a couple of short races. And very really soon after that, we kind of started getting addicted to running. It became so much part of our life. And what helped was that my sister and I did it together. And so we were always there motivating each other, you know, helping each other get up for, um, as basically as accountability buddies for those early morning trainings and early morning races and things like that. Yeah. So we both ended up, uh, increasing our distance quite substantially. We started running half marathons. We started running marathons and ultra marathons as well. What is it about running that you really enjoyed? Was it the physical? Was it the mental? Was it the sense of achievement? What really connected for you? I think it was firstly just knowing that I was doing something to to look after my body and that would keep me fit. That was quite important for me. I think unknowingly, it had a very big effect on maintaining my mental health as well. It wasn't really why I did it. I didn't realize that it was happening. But just looking at kind of how it kept me in balance, it really did have, have a really good effect on that. And then one of the main things was was definitely the sense of achievement of, you know, doing something really difficult and then finishing it and sometimes attacking something that you didn't think that you'd be able to do. Like, you know, when I started running, as I said earlier, I looked at these people that run 10 Ks and I was like, well, oh my word, that is so amazing. How do you do 10 Ks like in a training run? And before you knew it, I was doing 10 K training runs. I was doing 20, 30 kilometer training runs, some of them even by myself. And so just that sense of achievement of finishing it at the end of the day. And I really believe that endurance sport is something that changes you as a person. Like you are not the same person at the end of a marathon than the person that started the marathon. You are a different person, especially in ultra marathon as well. And especially if the conditions were hard, you know, it changes you in a way that, that you can just never go back. And that has a knock on effect on other areas of your life as well. Because the thing about doing hard things, it kind of, you know, it doesn't matter what the nature of it is. It's that muscle and, and not a physical muscle, but kind of a, I find it hard to put into words, but it's like a muscle that is trained that just helps you to be able to go through hard things. And so when you come up with a challenge, you know, socially or at work, it makes it easier to overcome because you might think, oh, this is so difficult. But then you think, but last week I ran an ultra marathon or, you know, last year I finished an Ironman. So surely I can do this. And it really kind of helps you to become a better person and a more resilient person in all areas of your life. And that, I think, is what just brings me back to it again and again and again. You talked about your progress that you made in running. I'd love to know, like, how did you progress maybe from the marathons to the ultra marathons? Did you join a running club? Did you figure out your own training? Were you on, were you on Google? Did you work with a running coach? You know, how did you make that transition and how did you train for sort of the next level, take you up to those ultra distances? Yeah. So, um, by that time I had definitely joined a club. Um, pretty much most of my marathons I did 
on my own training program that I either got from a coach or that I got online or something like that. I think it's very important if you do something like that to follow somebody that can give you professional guidance. So sometimes that is within your club that you're running with and sometimes it's outside the club. But what the club does um, provide is that sense of community, that sense of um you know, being part of something. So even if you're not doing all of your training with the club, but really kind of does help to just get through those things. And it also, obviously, it provides training buddies for you. In terms of stepping up to the bigger distances, I think the transition from a half marathon to a marathon is probably bigger than going from a marathon to an ultra. because. You know, that is a very, when you get to about, you know, a marathon is 42 kilometers and a half marathon is is half of that, so it's 21. And usually in a marathon between the points of like 30 to 35K is when it gets really, really, really difficult. And sometimes people will hit the wall, which is a a time where, you know, you your body just kind of gives in and you have to be able to push through that section because once you get through that section, through the wall, you know, the rest of the time you will be okay. And some people, they don't recover from that and then they, they actually don't finish. So, you know, when you're training for an ultra marathon, you generally would run about the same distances in training than you would for a marathon. And so it's more the mental aspect that comes into play there because your body is going to want to give up on you so many times, both in training and in the race. And it's the ability to push through that really makes the difference between, you know, somebody that's just running socially and somebody that is a serious runner that goes for marathons and goes for ultra marathons and and things like that. So, for example, when you're running, when you're training for a 56 kilometer race, I wouldn't generally run more than about, I'd say maybe 35 kilometers or so anyway. So, and the reason for that is that it takes very long to recover from those kinds of distances. So you can't run a marathon in training because then it's by the time you get to the race, your body would not have recovered from the training. So you do shorter distances but you run more often i'd say you know the mental part is what really comes into play there and it really that comes from from putting in the hard yards in training as well and going through the tough sessions sometimes there's one or two tough sessions in your training program of a few months that that can literally make or break your race day because those are the ones that really teach you how to to get through anything you know, it's when it was raining outside and you still went and you still did your 50 kilometers. And at the end of the day, you know, uh, whatever race day throws at you, I wouldn't say you're ready for it because it's still going to be hard, but you have um, got a little taste of it. And that resilience muscle has been worked a little bit more and you're a little more, bit more prepared than if you, if you hadn't done that. And for people who are listening, who are maybe thinking, oh, tough sessions, hard training, getting outside when it's raining. Why do people do this? Why do people push themselves like this? And I'd love for you to share maybe one of the, you know, the magical moments from one of your, for your rate, from one of your races or runs or, or training that you sort of look back on. It just, you know, makes you smile, fills your heart with joy. And I think, yeah, this is, this is, this is why I train. This is why I like being fit and healthy and, and strong. Um, yeah, share one of those magical moments. I think I'm going to jump to, to triathlon and Ironman year, if, if that's okay, because, um, I finished, I've done two full Ironmans. Um, and uh, Ironman is a 3.8 kilometer swim, 180 kilometer cycle and a 42 kilometer run. All within like, you have to finish in under 17 hours. So it's a pretty tough thing to do. It's, it's, kind of bent out as the toughest single day endurance event that you can do. 
I've done two of those and the last one I did was now in March 2020, so not too long ago. And race day was, gosh, we had every season thrown at us. On the morning, we literally had lightning and thunder, (laughs) like at the start of the race. And it was raining and then it was sunny. Uh, at some point on the course, like really, really hot. We had really high humidity. Then it got colder again. Then it rained again. And then it was thunder and lightning. And, and then it cleared up. And then later on in the evening, it was, you know, raining again and windy. And that's when I was running my marathon. So I was running a marathon like in the, mostly in the dark, pretty much half in the dark. And. I actually, as tough as the conditions were, it was the most enjoyable Ironman that I've ever done. It was the most enjoyable marathon that I've ever run, even though, you know, compared to Ironman marathons or standalone marathons where you just run a marathon. Yeah, I was running a marathon at the end of 180 kilometer cycle and, you know, a swim in the morning. I look back on that day and I wonder, like, you know, I, I actually had a really good day, although the conditions were really bad. And a lot of people said afterwards that, you know, the conditions were appalling. It was the worst Ironman they've ever done. If I look back at my training, the longest training ride that I did was very really similar conditions. And I'm speaking about the, the tough part of the conditions here, the, the wind, the rain and the cold. My longest cycle, it was only like about 115 kilometers, so under 120 kilometers, but it was raining and it was windy. And most of the people that I normally cycle with decided to not cycle. People were saying, don't go out, do your training at the gym rather. But by then I was already out. I was just cycling with one other person. And I actually messaged this guy after the race, a couple of days after the race, and I said, you know, I must thank you again for that session because that session prepared me so well for that race. Because when I got to the race, I being in that didn't even feel tough for me. And I think it was also the mental state that I was in because I was very switched on on the day, which really, looking back, made, you know, a really, really big difference to the way I could physically perform. But that really was something that I think formed my preparation for that. And yes, it's obviously not just that ride. It was the accumulation of all the rides and all the, you know, months of training that I've done. But sometimes, you know, you have these sessions that, you know, stand out as those were really, really felt horrible in the moment. And if I had to, be somebody looking from the outside, looking at, you know, somebody else doing that. I'll be thinking like, Oh my word. I do not want to do that. That sounds like a horrible idea. Like, why would you want to go out and get wet and get cold and, you know, all of those things. And of course, there is a limit as well to what you should endure in terms of safety. There are rides that I have stopped because I was felt like I was on the verge of getting hypothermia. So I'm not saying be unsafe. I'm saying within the limits. It's really if you can get yourself to actually grab those opportunities, I would call it, then it will really, really, really build you and change you as an athlete. And I'm, I'm really, you know, grateful for, for times like those. One of the things that you've talked about is the mental aspect, you know, doing, doing an Ironman under 17 hours, the swimming, the cycling, the running. And you've talked about sort of building that resilience muscle. And you also said, you know, being very switched on on the day and it really made a big difference and in terms of getting you know switched on on the day so mentally you are ready to go out to perform to give it your best what are you doing to mentally prepare before the race and during the race before the race there's a couple of things that I would do and and you know they all have kind of different time frames in which they're applicable but just before the race, I have an exercise that I always do for um, things that are challenging and it, it might not always be physical. Sometimes it's mental, sometimes it's speech that I need to give or, you know, an exam that I take. 
but I also use it for races and it is called power posing. And you know, listeners can, if you Google Amy Cuddy TED Talk, you will find an entire TED Talk about it. There's the condensed version and there's the full version. But she speaks how, you know, the body can change the mind and obviously the mind can change the body as well. So it's a two minute power pose that I do before the time and it kind of just, you know, lowers your cortisol level and raises your testosterone level a little bit. So that's what I do just before the race. In terms of long term before the race, there is the most important thing is to just put in the training because if you haven't put in the training, then I believe like obviously no amount of mental preparation is going to get you through something really, really tough. The physical preparation is key because that will get you in a mindset of being confident in your own abilities. And that is a very big part of staying calm during a race, you know, no matter what the race throws at you type of thing. Another thing that I did, actually for the first time before this Ironman, and it's the first time I've done something like this, even though I've been doing endurance sports for over a decade. I had like almost a debilitating anxiety about the race and about, you know, fears about not finishing, not making cut offs and about my abilities. And even though I was doing the training, I was just, I was just so scared that something terrible would happen because, um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm not a natural athlete. I'm not naturally fast or naturally strong. I've got to basically work for every little game that I have. Like, you know, if I always say that I am an example of, you know, proving that anybody can do things like an Ironman if you set your mind to it. Because if you're going to run with me, I'm likely to be the slowest runner, even amongst, you know, people that are not serious runners. Cycling as well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always at the back of the back. I'm always getting dropped within the first hour of a ride if I'm in a group ride or anything like that. So I had a lot of these fears playing on my mind, you know, am I good enough? Am I going to get through it? And one thing that helped me was actually going to a sports psychologist for a couple of sessions. And he helped me to kind of focus. He did some mental exercises in terms of um, just kind of unraveling that, those fears and, you know, getting to the root of it and, and then kind of, reprogramming my mind for success um so that was that was really something that I I haven't experienced before and I I didn't actually while I knew that I needed help I I didn't realize what a big help that would be and I, I would I would you know recommend to anybody and it's not just for you know, if you're having um, issues with sport, but, you know, any mental health issue, professional help is really, if you have the right person to help you, then it is invaluable. I mean, it took like two sessions to unravel all the fears that I had and to just get me in a state where if I feel that fear and if I feel that emotion coming on during a race or during a session, um, I was given tools to kind of work through that and to resolve that almost instantaneously and to turn that around. So that is something that helped me a lot. And I practiced it in the few sessions that I had left after I saw the school psychologist before the race. Um, and so on the day, I kind of used all of these things. I also read, um, I listened to a very amazing audio book on, you know, mental health techniques to help athletes. And um, so the book is called The Brave Athlete and it's by Simon Marshall and Leslie Patterson. They're husband and wife couple. The husband is a, he's got a PhD in sports science and the wife is a professional athlete. So. That dynamic also works really well because they both speak about, you know, experiences from different, um, from different sides of the fence in a way. And uh, the, the book was so great that I, I, I listened to it twice before the race. So all of those things kind of came together and it primed me to have a race 
that was so good that I didn't even realize what kind of zone I was in during the race because it's not something that I had to like psych myself up because sometimes you know we think we get in the zone you need to really psych yourself up you need to be like you know we think that being in the zone is loud but sometimes it's it is quite soft and it is quite gentle and it is just especially for a race that long we I mean I was going for over 15 hours it's a really good technique to be able to to control your emotions as well and there was also something that that my psychologist told me he was like try not to get too excited you know in the weeks leading up to the race because that also depletes your dopamine and you only have a limited amount of dopamine and you want to keep it all for the race you want to keep it all for pulling it out on that day and to unleash everything and it ended up that that was what I was able to do that I saw didn't think it was possible, but like felt fresh at the end of an island that I did in 15 and a half hours. One of the things I read on your blog that you shared two really powerful pieces called The Dark Side of Becoming an Iron Man, Mental Health Struggles. And I'd love for you to share maybe just a little bit more of your experiences of after the race and how you handled what was going on there. Yeah. So the first time I experienced this kind of, uh, really down period was after my first half Ironman, which was the year before I did my first full Ironman, about the year before, I'd say. So before that, I'd done lots of endurance events. I'd done ultramarathons and I'd re- never really experienced anything of the sort. So it was quite foreign to me. It was where I just felt, I mean, it was pretty much depression. There's no other word for it. And I initially felt very uncomfortable calling it that because I felt that, you know, I'd just been through something really amazing. I just achieved this great thing. And calling the state that I was in depression felt like a betrayal to the people going through real depression or what I would see as real depression because I was like, you know, people are going through hectic things in their life. And yeah, I'm like, Oh, I just finished Iron Man and I'm depressed. And like, obviously, you know, that's, that doesn't make any sense. So I was really struggling with going through that. I didn't have anyone to speak to. It was quite foreign. You know, I could feel my, my mental state was changing in a way. And it was hard to pinpoint at first because, you know, you look at everything else in your life and. You think, oh, it might be this, might be that, might be that. Like, why am I suddenly so teary for no reason at all? And it took me down quite a path of exploration where I had to kind of, where I tried to figure out, okay, what, what is happening? What is happening to me? I don't think it has happened to other people because I don't see anyone else speaking about it. I don't, nobody is talking to me about it really. One of my friends did allude to something of the sort, but I was like, uh, it didn't sound like, I was like, ah, you know, that's not going to happen to me. It's, it doesn't, it doesn't sound like I would be depressed after. I mean, not that it doesn't sound like, but I don't feel like I would be depressed. And only because he mentioned that did I start thinking, oh, it might actually be that. And then I started looking into it and, there actually wasn't much information, even online, about it. I dug deeper. I kind of had my own theories about it. And I go into detail, you know, about it in, in my blog post, which people are, are welcome to go and check out. But, you know, once I started speaking to people about it, I actually realized that so many other people were going through it as well. In fact, like everybody that I spoke to, of the people that I trained with, and granted I didn't speak to everybody, but those that I did speak to, every single person, there was not a single exception. Every single one of them had gone through a similar thing. And then I thought, but all of us have been through it. All of us have gone through this thing alone. It's not fair that people should go through alone, through it alone, because it's a really horrible thing to experience. That is why I felt the need to, you know, speak out about it. I speak about it every chance I get. I wrote about it and I hope that, you know, my blog posts help other people that are looking for answers when they go through something similar. And it's 
basically something that there's a lot of reasons for it. One is that, you know, as humans, we are very tribal. We need a community. We need a tribe. We need people that we can identify with. And Iron Man, it's such a demanding sport that you spend so much time with the people that you train with. You know, you train with them maybe on a Wednesday morning, you're doing track with them. On a Thursday morning, you're doing a bike ride. Thursday evening, you're doing a swim. Then Friday morning at 6 o'clock, you're swimming. You're doing your open water swim in the canal. So you see them often more than what you see some of your family. And so there's that really strong bond that is created between people, even people that might not know much about you might not know much about other sections of your friends' lives, of your training partner's lives, but you have that very, very strong kind of tribal bond. And then when the race is over, all of that dissipates. So maybe, you know, often training groups have like, they have a WhatsApp group. They have, um, you know, you see each other often. Now you're not seeing each other anymore. Now they dissolve the WhatsApp groups and you suddenly feel like, you're all alone in the world and you don't have the protection of the tribe that you used to have and you feel very exposed. And that is a normal human reaction that's like programmed into all of us, even though we might not, you know, realize it in that way. You know, some people could be searching for that feeling like the entire life and never ever get to it. You never really, really feel such a strong bond with people. And now you've found it and then suddenly you've lost it. That has a very strong, you know, mental um, effect on people. And then the other part is possibly a physical aspect as well, because you're doing less training, you know, you're not producing that much of the I'd call them happy hormones, just a term that that everybody would understand, because we all know that exercise produces certain hormones in your body and it's not possible to keep going like if you've done with an Ironman you have to rest you have to take a couple of weeks downtime you know some people get started earlier than others in their training again but it's going to be at a lower intensity even somebody who trains like six hours a week that that is a lot for a normal person but if you're training for Ironman you're training like 12, 15 hours a week sometimes. So to go from 12 hours a week to six hours a week, that's like, you know, you're half your load. Yes, it's, yet it's still much higher than a normal person would experience. And so your hormones are a little bit out. And, and essentially that is what depression is. It is a, a chemical imbalance in your brain. It doesn't have to be caused by anything happening in your life. It doesn't have to be caused by anything horrible. And, 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 you know, people need to, to start understanding that. And it's only when we speak about it that more people are going to start realizing that and start being okay with it. Not just the people who are experiencing, but also the people outside that are judging them in terms of almost a a right to feel that way. Whereas, you know, I don't believe anybody needs anyone's permission to feel a certain way because it's not like you choose to do that. But yeah, that is basically the the phenomenon that I ended up studying in my own way, my own amateur way, and kind of testing those theories that I ended up coming with against the research that was out there. I started linking that, oh, this is what is happening and this is like, you know, I'm not, I'm not going crazy trying to link things that, that do not exist. Yeah. That is, uh, pretty much my journey with post race depression. And I feel, I also feel that the reason why it's so important to speak about it is that part of how we can fix that or not fix it, but almost mitigate it in a way because different people feel it at different intensities and you can reduce the severity of it by firstly just recognizing what it is and recognizing that you're going through this and then try and do things that will help you manage it in a way and then 
eventually heal from it as well. When you finished uh, an Ironman, what are you doing for rest and recovery? And how long do you give yourself before you start thinking about taking on another challenge? What does that look like for you? I give myself quite a bit of rest. I would generally take at least a month of doing almost nothing. And then I'd start like really slowly with very little exercise, like, you know, social, maybe social running, a little bit of cycling and stuff. But I wouldn't plan anything big until I've completed my recovery, especially after, you know, after the mental health challenges that I, that I'm aware of now that, that could possibly happen. I try and not give myself illusions of, Oh, I'm going to do another marathon like in two months time. Because after my first Ironman, I made that mistake. I knew that I wouldn't be able to do two oceans ultra, which was like, I think it was three weeks after Ironman. But I thought, okay, I'll do the half marathon. I mean, I'm so fit. I've been doing all of this training. I've run much bigger distances before that. And like surely three weeks afterwards, I would be able to run 20 kilometers. That was so wrong. (laughs) I struggled to run 10Ks. I was just, I felt broken. Like I just, I couldn't run. And I'm a runner. That's my strongest out of the three. And so now I just give myself quite a lot of time. Like I did Ironman now in March. I'm looking at maybe doing bigger running distances, like towards the end of the year, maybe six to eight months later. But I'll also try and be gentle with myself in terms of that. Because, yeah, in 2019, I was six months later. I still was not feeling good when I was training and I spoke to some of my coaches and I was like, I don't know what is wrong with me. And I mean, it's six months later and I'm still feeling terrible when I do anything. And then they told me, no, it's, it's completely normal. You basically, you know what you do to yourself, to your body, to your muscles. Like you need to recover, do other things. Like it's totally normal to six months later still be feeling like, um, like, uh, like you're recovering, although, you know, mentally we might feel like it's too long. Like I can't be doing, I can't be taking half a year to recover from one race. So now I try to focus on other things after a big race like that. Currently I'm training to become a triathlon technical official, which is something that uh, luckily for me, the opportunity came up um you know, within a month after I I finished the race and I was like, perfect, because this is an opportunity to still be part of the community, but not to be racing, which is also one of the things that I recommend to to kind of um, to mitigate your post-race depression is to still be involved, but in a different way. And so um, I'm doing that. And I I don't even have, I haven't entered for anything big. I'm doing social races and I'm doing social trainings. But yeah, that is basically how I manage myself afterwards. Who are the women that inspire you, especially in the world of running and triathlon? You know, who are your role models? Do you have any mentors, women that you look up to? The people that inspired me. To even start in triathlon were people that I generally found on social media, just people that I was following on Twitter, following on Instagram. Um, and it's because I saw them doing it that I, you know, started kind of doing it, which is what I hope to be for other people as well. I hope to be an inspiration for somebody to say, Oh, she did it. So I can possibly do it as well. I have, um, women that I follow that, you know, that are almost like, I wouldn't say celebs, but, you know, people at the top of the game, like like Lucy Charles. I mean, she's British. She is absolutely brilliant. She is the multiple Ironman champion. She won the race in the the first time I did Ironman in 2019. She won the South Africa Ironman. And, uh, yeah, so there's people like that. There's Chrissy Wellington, which is also actually British. She's retired now, but she was a phenomenal athlete in her time. She was a machine. 
especially a running machine. She used to run like the fastest split on the day, which is like, I mean, faster than all the men even. She was holding multiple world records and she was just an amazing person overall as well. Like after her race, she stayed on the finish line and she used to hand out medals to like all the finishers until the midnight finish, even though she had pretty much pulled out everything to physically to to win the race and she could have easily just gone to a hotel to shower and rest but she doesn't do that so you know these people like that that I follow and that I draw inspiration from then there's also some people on social media that are like not professionals but they're really really inspiring there's one US hijabi athlete as well that I recently started following she does a lot of advocacy in terms of just fighting for the rights of women and fighting for the rights of um, underrepresented people in sports. Her name is Hadija, Hadija Triathlete on Instagram, if anybody wants to follow her. She was instrumental in changing some of the rules in World Triathlon and the World Ironman Federation to actually allow hijabis to compete with full coverage without being penalized, because there are instances, I've never had a problem, but I know that there are instances where if, for example, there's one rule that if the swim is non-wetsuit, then you're not allowed to have anything that covers further than your knees or your elbows, which for us would be a problem because I wear full length tights and, and long sleeves when I compete. And so, yeah, there's, there's obviously reasons why that rule is there, but it inadvertently affects some other people that the rule was not made to affect. And in some cases, they're really strict in enforcing it, like in the US, for example. And so she has been advocating for, for those rule changes. Those rule changes have come through now. So pretty much everyone from now onwards for generations will we, you know, benefit from that. And then there's women as well that, that I know in, in my personal life that um, most of them I've also met through social media that I follow and that are just phenomenal people. I mean, my friend Bianca, she, she won her division at the half Ironman and, and she's got a toddler. She's a mom of like a two year old and she still manages to put in the training. And to hold down a full-time job and to be a wife and a mother. And, you know, those kind of things are, are really inspiring to me. So I draw from all of these people. And those are just people I mentioned, but there's, there's many others as well that I just look to and I admire the strength of these women. And I draw from that to kind of help fuel myself. You're a two-time Ironman finisher and you were the first and still the only one in South Africa to do a full Ironman in a hijab. Yes. Which is just incredible. Talk about leading the way and blazing, <laughs> blazing your own trail. Have you started to have more conversations with Muslim women who are sort of curious about triathlons and Ironman and, and running and, and how to do it with the hijab? I have uh, had more conversations. There are also many hijabis in South Africa that are, are doing smaller triathlons and half Ironmans. I mean, I'm not going to claim that I'm the reason they did that, but it's definitely, it helps to see somebody doing it and then, you know, to kind of follow. Because for me, it was very difficult. I had nobody to look to and I had to figure out everything myself. So, you know, often we think, you know, being the first is like glamorous in a way, but it, it really isn't because besides like trying to train for triathlon, you also have to figure out, okay, gosh, what am I going to wear? What I don't want to wear something that's going to make me slower, that's going to cause drag, that's, you know, I, I want coverage, but I still want, you know, to be able to, to get it on in a reasonable time. And, and you know, I want it to be technical fabrics. And so there's a lot of research that kind of goes into that. And there has been, I must say, there has been women that has asked me, that has kind of asked for advice, one friend of mine that started with triathlon a few years ago, she basically asked me, look, what, what do you wear? What, how does it work? Especially in, uh, in terms of changing as well. Like, you know, how do you change between the cycle and the run or between the swim and the cycle? 
And so those conversations have become more prevalent. I do want to still write a blog post about that, which is way overdue because, I mean, not everybody is going to speak to me or you know, ask me. So I want to be out there where people can, can actually, when they're looking for something, to find it. Like when I was looking for something and I, and I couldn't really find anything because there was, there was just nobody doing it. Rahima, where would be the best place for people to connect with you? Where are you most active on social media? My most active social media platform is definitely Instagram. My Instagram handle is at Rahima. So it's just at and my name, which is R-O-G-E-M-A. And then, of course, you can follow my blog, which is RahimaKinney.com. There are a few blog posts um, specifically related to this type of thing, you know, to support to especially beginners starting in triathlon and just tips on tips on how to get started for somebody that just doesn't know where to start at all. Just in terms of equipment, how expensive is it? Can you do it on a budget? That type of thing. I'm also going to specifically have a post on um, hijabis wanting to do triathlon and kind of things that I've learned along the way in terms of what works and what doesn't work and, and just tips to to make you as efficient as somebody that is not wearing hijab because I don't believe that it should be a hindrance. Um, it definitely is not a hindrance for me. It was in the beginning when I wasn't quite um, knowing what I was doing, but I would want to leverage the experience of the last few years and, and, and help other people as well. Awesome. And Rahima, I'd love for you to have final words of advice, final words of wisdom, or most specifically in relation to that, you know, advice for Muslim women, advice for, for women who wear the hijab. What would you like to share with them to encourage them to take that first step, to sign up for their first marathon, their first Ironman, to get out there and to take on these types of challenges? What would you like to share? What I would like to share is that I want to tell people, um, whether you're in hijab or not, you know, whether you're Muslim woman or not, some, a lot of times society puts us in a box. And if you are not the type of person that you see or that society would see as doing something like an Ironman, then often we think that we are not capable of doing it. You know, I'm too big, I'm too weak, I'm too this or that or that or that or whatever. Don't listen to any of those things. You can do whatever you want to do and you can do it whatever choice you decide to make in terms of what you want to wear, how you want to conduct yourself. It might take a little bit harder work. It might take you to train a little bit more, to be disciplined. But if you can see it, and this is a clear scientific fact, if you can see it in your head, if you can see yourself doing it, it means you're capable of doing it. And it doesn't mean that you're capable of doing it today or tomorrow. You obviously have to put in the work. But as long as you are prepared to do the work, there is literally nothing that can stop you. And in terms of um, my advice for hijabis, let's do it. Let's get more people out there. Let's get more hijabis out on the triathlon courses, on the running races, because we need to show the younger girls that anything is possible. You know, the Iron Man motto is anything is possible. Those are the words that I live by. I mean, a couple of years ago, it was seven years ago now, I, I couldn't swim at all. I could have said I can't do triathlon because I can't swim. But I learned to swim, even though it was so difficult. It was really, really hard. But it was so rewarding at the end of the day. You are not the same person at the other side of it. And it's going to benefit you in every single aspect of your life absolutely rahima thank you so much for being on the podcast it's been amazing to speak to you and best of luck with all your future ironmans and triathlons and running races just incredible what you're doing and thank you so much for sharing your story on the tough girl podcast thank you for having me sarah it's been amazing chatting to you
Hey Tribe, we are celebrating the 8th year anniversary of the Tough Girl podcast today, the 4th of August 2023. And to do that, there are four episodes being released today, one at 7am, 11am, 3pm and 7pm. There's also going to be nine episodes going live throughout the month of August. I do just want to say a massive thank you to everyone who has been listening and supporting the work of the Tough Girl podcast. Without the patrons and the financial support, the Tough Girl podcast would not be around today and these stories would not be shared. Thank you to all of the incredible patrons. If you've been listening for a while and want to support the work, then you can make a one-off donation via PayPal. There's the link on the Tough Girl website, toughgirlchallenges.com, or you can sign up as an annual or monthly patron via Patreon, www.patreon.com forward slash toughgirlpodcast. And wherever you're listening in the world, Patreon should have your currency available. So you can just donate in your currency. Delighted to share that the next episode is with Alexandra Allred. Alexandra is a former professional athlete and author of When Women Stood, the untold history of females who changed sports and the world, which was published earlier on this year in February. So Alexandra made sports and medical history through activism and determination. This is an episode well worth listening to. As are all of the Tucker podcast episodes, there are now 650 episodes in the back catalogue, which is epic. So please do tell one friend about the Tough Girl podcast. Share the joy, share the stories, and you could change someone's life. So many women reach out to me and tell me about the adventures and challenges that they have done after listening to the women on the Tough Girl podcast, which is what it is all about, motivating and inspiring you. Thank you so much for being on this journey with me. All that's left for me to say is, wherever you are, whatever you are doing, give it your all, give it 110%, get after it, go for it, believe in yourself, because I believe in you. Take care, lots of love, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.